Moderator Request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And my name is Professor Mark Sheriff. And, Will, we're coming up on 10 episodes, and... It's we, such we a big anniversary. To... So few podcasts make it. What do you... <laughs> you know, honestly... Technically, okay. I, I did a podcast that had one episode. Well, okay. D- yeah, two thumbs up right there for two... No, I think it's... That's a legitimate question, honestly. I've never actually gone and looked through, like, Apple Podcasts or something like that to see which ones, you know, only have, you know, X number episodes. Now, you might say something like, well, Serial Season 1, I think, was eight episodes, and it was one of the most wild, widely, right, yeah. you know, popular podcasts for a long time, I yeah. think. Um, well, you get, a not- lot of, you get a lot of Pareto rule there, where there's a lot of podcasts that never get a listener. Actually... One would say it'd probably be a sizable proportion. Exactly. Well, it's like our argument about Twitch viewers exactly. that we had it's back a, in episode, yeah. I don't know, too. You know, it was so no. long ago. I can't remember back that far. But <laughs> Ziffian. <laughs> the Ziffian, right. Yes. yes when you, Ziffian. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, good, the, the good old days of... The good old days of Ziffian. Yeah, exactly. Well, but so so we were talking, you know, in between shows, and I was mentioning how we were we were dipping a little bit too much into, into lecture mode. Where I, you know, I pick a question. It's like, let me tell you exactly what I think about the chip shortage. And it's, you know, the other person's like, yep, yep, yep. So I was like, okay, I'm, I, I've got some surprises today. Try and lighten yeah. the mood. Try and, you know, get things a little bit more exciting. And then, then Will sends me a message today. It says, so I'd like to do an episode on doomsday scenarios. I would. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I don't, is that really the Will energy McBurney. we're going for? Mood killer. <laughs> like, new killer for new, hire. I have a new segment, a new exciting segment that I was, uh, and we're still going to do it. I'm a buzz hit honest, man. And, and, what was that? I'm a buzz hit man. There you go. Well, okay. I, I think honestly, I think a doomsday episode could be a lot of fun. I think it. That sounds really weird to say, but you know, it, it's you know, we go in and it's like, okay, and here's the scenario, and here's you know how how it hilariously. Maybe we don't all die. I don't really mm. know. But uh, well, we, we should plan that and figure it out. I mean, it seems like that should be like a Halloween episode. Yeah, if we it, seems, make it seems fitting. I mean, fitting. October is not that far away. We can probably make it. But Yeah, but we do have that whole class thing starting soon. I have no idea how actually semester starting is going to affect us. I really don't know. Yeah. Although, although, is this the time to announce that, that we're going to have our first live show? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. In, in, yeah. In uh, class. We should sell tickets. Actually, that, we should. That's a bad idea uh, right now. <laughs> um, that that seems like that could go really badly, really fast. I, I think t- tickets cost something like what fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars for tuition. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what tuition is. Something like that. Well, I mean, it, in state, that that number doesn't seem too too far off. Um, mm. I think it's higher. Uh, I think it's a bit higher, but. Out of state, I know it's a lot higher. We we are going to freak out these kids when we show up down at the front with our podcasting equipment and go, welcome to Regrade Request and see what happens. So I'm looking forward to it. But before yeah. then, we still have episode nine to get through. Mr. McBurney, do you have a question to lead us off? I do. So um, I I remember... That when I was uh, first starting to teach at uh, at Penn, this was 2016 or so, how everyone, the hot button thing everyone was talking about was self-driving cars, self-driving cars. You had Chevrolet coming out and saying, we're going to have fully autonomous vehicles 2019. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't, right now, granted, it's kind of hard to buy cars. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Chevy guy myself, so I haven't checked their dealership. Do you, do you have you seen any... Chevy self-driving cars. Tesla's fully self-driving by now, obviously, right? I okay. I well, one. I haven't left the house in eighteen months, basically. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, sure. I guess I've driven some, you know. Mm. But 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 no. I I don't know if I would even have known a self-driving car if I've seen it. But back to the point of buying cars. It is this something that happened while I was just like holed up in my own personal COVID bunker? That there's is it like Carvana or something where it's 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 like mm. a car vending machine or something <laughs> yeah, like this. It's so. Car dealerships are weird, basically because car taxes are such a big portion of state budgets, they can effectively write their own rules, which is why buying a new car is such a bizarre process. 
think about it. Like if you go to Walmart, you, you don't have to go to Walmart for Kellogg cereal and Kroger's for post cereal, right? They have it. They have both at the same place. Like Coke and Pepsi are sold in both stores, like <gasps> both of them. No. Yet when you go to buy a car, there's the Ford dealership and the Chevrolet dealership and the Honda dealership and the Mazda dealership. Um, and more than almost anything else sold in the United States, no one knows exactly like what the profit margins on these things are because they're just so well hidden. Um, and then, of course, you have questions about lost leaders that are high gas mileage and you know whether or not that's actually true. Uh, so used car sales, on the other hand, are much more readily available. Uh, and so Carvana it's like GameStop. Is kind of, right. And so Carvana is <laughs> kind of taking advantage of that to try to make effectively a national uh, Internet based used car sales system. OK, sure. But self-driving cars, I yeah no but by i don't the way, think the question i've seen was about self-driving cars just, just yeah i know well I, but hey but here's the thing all of these companies made very strong statements about how you know like we're not doing it in 2020 we're doing it in 2019 and we're here in 2021 and we still don't have self-driving cars and i want to know well, actually i mean I've, I've done research on this i want to know what you think some of the reasons that we haven't hit these targets so far. Well, I mean, okay. So typically the reason I would say we haven't hit targets so far is marketing is often BS. And they yep, <laughs> that's, that's a big one. <laughs> and, and, but you know, we, you and I both have a colleague that is in this space, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Madur Bell, mm -hmm. who runs our, our autonomous driving uh, research lab at UVA. He, ha he teaches a class called F one tenth, which is hilarious. I love it. Um, <laughs> where, you know, he teaches students how, and how he did this during COVID is still amazing to me. You know, they did it all by simulation, but he has tracks to run them all. So, you know, I know that research is going on in this area. And so, you know, it, it's still an active thing. Why major car companies haven't done it? I mean, there's the cynical reason where it's, you know, things like because self-driving cars would drive more efficiently and not use more gas. So the big gas companies are, yeah, I could, you know, okay, yes, I get the, the I, I'm giving the a skeptical look at the moment, which, which, <laughs> hang I, on, let me I, find I, my tinfoil. I'm getting I my tinfoil. I am I got cynical my tin of your cynicism, sir. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right so, okay. Um, Marketing, that's always a reason. Yeah. I mean, so, well, COVID let's, is let's always start, a reason. Well, let's start with marketing. Okay. So a big problem with the marketing is that it implies there's a there's a, a light switch that's going to be flipped. And we're going to go to completely driving the cars by ourselves to completely autonomous vehicles. And we haven't been driving cars by ourselves at least new cars since like the 80s, because you're talking like anti-lock braking system. That's an autonomous system. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cruise you know, control. Cruise control. An autonomous system. Now, those are considered lane often, assist. Uh, la well, so that, that, that that's newer. So oftentimes sure, with autonomous still. vehicles, they break it down from level one, which is completely manually driven to like Fred Flintstone to like level two. You're getting into really <laughs> simple stuff. Anti-lock braking systems, uh, stability control, potentially, you know, varies between level one or two, depending on how sophisticated it is. Um, level five would be fully autonomous vehicles. Tesla okay. has a lot of things that you would argue could be level four. Things like lane assist, things like uh, assisted cruise control, where if oh. the cars slow down in front of you, it will automatically slow down. Sure, lots of a cars lot, have that now. A lot of cars have automatic emergency braking. A lot of cars have automatic parallel parking, which... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So one thing I think is that we need to accept that this is going to happen by increments, as it turns out most things do. And we're not going to flip a switch and suddenly end up with, with self-driving cars. Robo-drivers. I, yeah. I think the marketing implied that that was much closer to the horizon than it is. The problem is a lot of these autonomous features... Are ha have been advertised in, I would say, dangerous ways. Uh, for example, there's like, you know, look, automatic lane assist. 
and the person on the in the driver's seat just completely lets go of the steering wheel and is like, "Oh, look, it's staying <laughs> late." No, no, don't do that. That's insane. What? Why would you? Why would you suggest that's okay? In fact, there was a case where a Tesla in North Carolina, I believe it was, uh, ran headlong into a truck at full speed, um, and and. Uh, there was no attempt at braking whatsoever, and what seems to have been the case, it was an overcast day and the truck had like a white-gray side, so it seems likely that the sensors couldn't distinguish the sky from the side of the truck, and the driver must not have been paying attention because they did nothing to prevent their fate, and they ran into the truck at, at full highway speed. And Ooh. it's and 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 frankly, I think advertising these you know automated lane assist tools and 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 that encourages that type of behavior. It's not the Jetsons, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it's not. Well, it's a similar argument that I, I've seen made is that a lot of the auto autopilot system of on planes have gotten so sophisticated that pilots are not developing the skill sets they need in order to succeed when the autopilot well, fails. Well, how much of that is, how much of that is hearsay rumor slash, slash I mean, because I've, I've heard that too, but slash like, Slash attributing I, pilot error as much as possible. Um, I, I, I tend to be of the mindset that I, I, I can buy that. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a certain cynicism one should have, but we've actually seen, um, you know, high, highway auto deaths were just going way down. This is safer cars, better seatbelt enforcement, better highway design, better barriers have been going down. And lately they've just started jumping again. Um, and the most likely culprit seems to be distracted driving. Well, I mean, and, and another thing that has to be taken into consideration, and I don't mean to. This is ruling out COVID, by the way. That sure. is ignoring yeah, 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 yeah. that, ignoring I, that huge blip on the radar. I feel like I call out my parents every episode. Maybe this is a running thing now, but my parents got a new car that had lane assist and the lane assist was so bad on this particular vehicle because the computer was not calibrated properly. And my mm -hmm. father, who is an engineer, you know, realized this and it's like arguing with the car company. Hey, this yeah. is not working because the lane assist is actively trying to hurt them. <laughs> my mother's like, I'm not driving this car. And I was like, yeah. that's good. I'd prefer my father not drive it either. Love them both. Uh, but they did eventually get the, the dealership to do a complete wipe on their car. So what I'm telling you folks is software testing is hard. It is. And uh, we shouldn't be testing with the car on the highway. Yeah. But, but it, it, you know, it's a tough problem. But we know smart people that are working on it. But what's the toughest part of the It's going to keep getting better. Hmm? So, so there's when we say it's a tough problem, in your view, what is the toughest part of the problem? Okay, here's my, my cynical software engineering slash security side. The toughest part of the problem is always the human. Problem between keyboard and chair. Mm -hmm. Pepcac. So, you know, the problem is, as noted, someone who trusts too much in the system so far... Um, someone who is completely disengaged from the driving. It's not fully Jetsons. Yep. Um, you know, th these are systems that are meant to be assisting, uh, even if it is quote unquote, if we got to the point of fully autonomous driving, I, I don't think I'd be comfortable with fully autonomous driving at least, you know, with technology today, unless the cars are on rails. Well, so another issue is not just the human in the car, but the humans in other cars. So, uh, Which is always the problem. It, it's bro when you're it's driving. broken down into like the two big problems. One is just straight up observation. How do you look at the road and interpret where you're supposed to drive, how to behave based on traffic signals, signs, etc.? Um, you know, how do you recognize a pedestrian so you you avoid them, for example? Um, or pro tip, do but that. But then there's the prediction element because we build up these inherent predictions when we're driving as to how people are going to behave. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is intuition based and not all that intuition mm, yeah. is good. For example, uh, self-driving cars atrophied. <laughs> well, so for example, self-driving cars have a significant problem getting through four way intersections with stop signs. 
Why huh. do they have trouble? Because humans don't actually stop at those. Well, okay. Yeah, that's through. fair. Yeah. And, and when the car that you're monitoring to say, okay, I need to wait for that car to stop before it's safe for me to go. When it's just creeping forward and doing a rolling stop, what ends up happening is the self-driving car stops because it errs on the side of caution. Because, of course, safety is the most important thing. Err on the side of caution, right? And then it gets rear-ended, which happened a lot in California, hmm. uh, where they would have self-driving cars on the road. So those are kind of the big elements. One, one of the things we have to consider is there's going to be a period where there's self-driving cars on the road at the same time as human drivers. And that actually makes the problem significantly harder than if we could flip a switch to go from, okay, we have human drivers. Okay. Now every driver is autonomous. If every driver is autonomous, cars can communicate back and forth with one oh, another. Sure, yeah. You, you you'd also be talking about a lot more efficiency at that point. Things, yeah. Well, and then, then you could also use like, you know, the wisdom of crowds, albeit with computer vision. So that way, sure. you're you're getting a better aggregate picture. You're using networked intelligence. You know, I think at that point you'd have a lot more safety. Except, it's going to be a really slow process to get there, where there's that critical mass needed for that to occur. And how do we mitigate all those bad human drivers uh, in the interim? Mm. But you know what? But, I by that I mean. By that, I mean people from Ohio. I should be. Oh, I was going to say, well, I bet at least autonomous drivers are good about making sure they turn off their turn signal after they make that left turn <laughs> out of the driveway in the morning. What? Hey, you, you still see turn signals? I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, would you like to play a game? This sounds like the intro to Saw. Stay it away does. from my leg, sir. It is going to be way more fun than that. This is left something leg, I'm very. Preferably, by the way. Okay, just, just one. Just one. This game is called me. Excuse me, what now? Excuse me, what and now? Okay. Excuse me, what now? And right. we we are doing a podcast called Regrade Request, but I realize we have not actually looked at any real regrades. Okay. So, what I have for you, Professor McBurney, in your 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 expertise as a professor, I have three sets of of three excuses for you. Okay. In each of these sets, two of them are real excuses that either I have received or were posted by a fellow professor on the professor's subreddit. Okay. One of them cheat. is no, don't go cheat. One of them is fake. And so right. everyone can play along. At I like home. this. All right. So you have three questions. You got to get two of them right in order to win. Okay. This First sounds like, wait, wait, don't tell me. I like the, it. Well, the, the Maybe will, I had some inspiration, okay? Will, will you record a voicemail message for me if I win? I will absolutely. Yeah, I was going to make this joke, but then you, I, I, I decided it was a little too on the nose, but I, I, yes. I love uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Anyway. Uh, who doesn't? All a right. college professor who likes NPR. How original. Go ahead. All right, so here's the first set of three. All right. Number one. I'm sorry, professor, but I can't attend the mandatory meeting with you because it was scheduled during my birthday week. I can come in the week after. Okay. Number two. Birthday week, got it. There's this bridge near the middle of campus that's really low, and trucks often get stuck under it and have their tops ripped off. Well, I got stuck in traffic behind the truck this time, and I missed the test. Can I come by tomorrow to retake it? Uh, I just, just to let people know, in Charlottesville, there is very much such a bridge. So. And number three. Hi, Professor. My doctor has recommended to me to avoid stress, so I won't be coming to the test today. I'll let you know when I feel comfortable taking the test in the future. All right. Um, so number one, mandatory I, meeting yeah. during birthday so, so week. Birthday, bridge, and stress. Those, yep. th that's what I'm going to call them. Given that we're in Charlottesville, it, the thing is, you could totally make up to, and, and you know that I would be like, oh yeah, that, that totally happened. Um... Because I, I could imagine that. I, and I, I have seen such trucks get stuck under. I don't think we have any cameras set up a la 11 foot 8, but we should. Um, I'm going to go ahead and rule out that. So I'm on birthday or stress. I'm going to go with... Again, I'm identifying the fake one. I'm going to identify the fake yes. one. Yep. I think, and I might be cheating, but and maybe I'm just Mandela affecting myself right now, but I think you told me about three before. So I think I'm going to go with the first one. We're going to go with the birthday. Oh, the birthday one? Yeah. 
It's the bridge one. I've yeah, actually never it, that, received the bridge excuse. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, it, it it's a good one. It's a very good one to make up because there is actually an mm. issue we have with a bridge very close to grounds, uh, a railroad bridge. They can't move it. So, all right, let's see if you can make it up here in question all number right. two. Here we go. All right, number one. As I'm sure you know, the latest World of Warcraft expansion just came out and my guild needs me to grind levels as fast as possible to start raiding. I know you're a gamer, Professor Sheriff, so I know you understand. I'll turn in my programming assignment next week. Number two. I'm a member of the College Quidditch Club, and this year we're going to Nationals. That means there's a good chance I'll be missing lab on Monday. Is there anything I, actually, I can do? Sorry, I have to interrupt. I know you've told me that one before. Sorry, go ahead. Or is there an excused lab that week? And number three, sorry I missed lab the other day. I was in jail. Can I make it up later this week? I'm almost certain you've told me the Quidditch one. I just just because I, I, I remember hearing that because I, I remember thinking the question before, like, how do you actually play that? Um, all right. So once again, looking at one and three. So one was all right. Well, three was they were in jail. One was World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft. And don't let the fact I threw, like, the word sheriff in there at all. I am kind of, you know... No, I, I, I'm i actually... So, I, I'm, I did at once have a student get very upset uh, in a class that I was taking, not, like, when I was a student. Get very upset at the teacher who canceled uh, an exam that was scheduled for November 11th, 2011. Because Skyrim came out that day, and they mm -hmm. walked all the way to class and didn't get to play Skyrim... And then the exam was canceled that day. And so they stormed out of the room. This actually happened. Mm. Um, I'm going to go with the first one, though. I, th I think I think I can. I can imagine. I, I know I've actually had a student in jail before, so I'm going to go with the first one. And you are right. right I have never received the World of Warcraft excuse. <laughs> The Quidditch student actually became a TA for the class that we both teach right now. Yeah. He TA'd for us for a year. And yes, I did have a student come to me and say, I was in jail. I missed that first <sighs> one was was just seemingly too brazen. But I thought the birthday one was as well. Anyway. OK. All right. This is it. Rubber match. Here you go. Okay. Last one. Here we go. Number one. I'm sorry, Professor. My computer has a virus that prevents me from uploading PDF or Word files. At my last school, when I submitted work, it took down every computer at the university. My father has taken my files into his office on a USB stick, and he works for the Department of Defense, where he will use their supercomputer to remove the virus. I hope to have the files to you in the next few days. That's number one. Number two. I, I, I think in the future when we do this, by the way, I would like to say, like, what the class is, if, if we could narrow it down to that, because I think that would help out. You anyway. are requiring to me to do way more preparation than I'll, I did for I'll, this. I'll do it next week. I'll do the <laughs> prep next week. No, no, it's fine. Uh, number two, this week I'm going to Disney World for the first time and it has always been my dream to ride Space Mountain. What can I do to make sure my dream becomes a reality and I still pass your class? And number three, this morning while running, I found a dead body. Can I please be excused from taking the final exam? Um, let me ask you this. Was the third student Joaquin Phoenix in the movie Stand By Me? <laughs> By the way, that was actually Joaquin Phoenix, if you didn't know. Um, so we have the elaborate computer virus. We have, we have Disney World for the first time. We have computer and... virus, Disney World, and Joaquin Phoenix. All right. There you um, go. Which one is so, the so fake one? I want one? to clarify why I asked, like, what class this would be for. Because I know you've taught intro programming before. Mm-hmm. And I could well, actually... Well, well, but no, you wouldn't do a PDF well, me, in that. Well, well, no, let me clarify this. R remember okay. I said... Some of these are ones that I've received. Some of these okay. are ones that right. were from professors. So are we mixing there, and matching, though? Because I will say this. OK, right. uh, here, here's your hint uh, for er, for question one. Both of the, the true ones came from the subreddit. OK, for number All two, right. both of them came from me for question three. One of them is from professors. One of them is from me and one of them is fake. Okay. So they're the, of the three options, All one right. is mine. One is from Reddit and one is fake. All right. Or at least I couldn't find it. Because they've probably been used somewhere. 
All right. So, so hey, de- the, dead air let, is let, great let, for a let's podcast. Sort these, sorry. I know. Let's <laughs> sort these from, from least likely to most likely. I'm going to go with the least likely would be the dead body. The next least likely would be the Department of Defense thing. And then the the most likely, I would imagine, would be Disney World. So that means Disney World is obviously the fake one. So I'm going to say Disney World is fake. And you are correct. You win the game. Congratulations. Disney right. World is fake. Now. Wait, it is? We have Disney just World ruined so many children's dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so in case you're curious, the dead body, that was an excuse that I did receive. And I was teaching a summer class and a student was out for a run. And I, I, know, I knew the student and I, there was a police report. And I said, you are fine. You already had an A in the class. You don't need to take the final. Yeah. Just, you're done. You're done. Yeah, that is an extreme story. We'll have to edit down all my pauses there while I thought. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for the first game of, excuse me, what now? Yeah. And I hope that the people at home were able to, to guess them as well. All right. And in fairness, I did get a lot of hints on that third one. But All right. Well... With that, let's move on to another question. Now, this one is going to be a question that isn't really a right or wrong answer, but I want to get... uh, So so we're both gamers, but you also teach a class on game design. That is true. Uh, and, and, And the emphasis of the class isn't explicitly on, like, you know, building, like, a graphics game or anything like that, but on getting into what the idea of fun in a game is how do you generate that fun, right? My, yep, my version of class, that's how I teach it. Yeah, yep. v- much more focused on the design rather than than making like uh, a product than say OpenGL, for example. Yep. So with that, based on your expertise, what are two or three of the games that you have played that you think are the best designed? And I want to quali- qualify this. Not your favorite games. Mm-hmm. Not the games that you even think are the best games taken as a whole, mm-hmm. but specifically just from a standpoint of design, what are some examples that you would think of? Tetris. Tetris? Number one. Tetris is the best design game okay. of I, I, all time. Yeah, I like that. It, it's, it's it's a very approachable game. You don't really have to mm-hmm. learn it. Yeah, I like mm-hmm. it. No, and, and the fact that Nintendo, you know, launched the Game Boy with it was probably one of the smartest mm-hmm. things that Nintendo as a company has ever done. Um, but Tetris is a game that uh, anyone can basically pick up. It's it's easy to understand. It is addictive. It has it it um, has no end. You can continue playing it. And then they have iterated on the Tetris formula many, many different times to do other interesting forms of drop block puzzles. Mm-hmm. So by far, number one, best design game ever is Tetris. I love now, Tetris effect, by the way. Great. Tetris effect is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tetris DS is probably my favorite version of Tetris. Right. Um now, if we were to expand this further into, you know, kind of more, let, let's say more, I don't know if richer experiences is kind of what I want to say, but broader? Super Mario Brothers, hmm? broader, maybe broader. broader sure. Yeah. Super Mario Brothers three is mm-hmm. probably another game that I would point at, um, particularly because of the way that it structures um, the the rise and fall of of. Uh, bite size fun, I suppose, because a right. level in Super Mario Brothers three, if you show it to when you show it to people nowadays, the levels are very short, right. but that's intentional. And the idea is that there's this kind of nugget of entertainment and then you drop back to a map, you refocus and that kind of play pattern of spike of of action, then up and down, up and down. 30 seconds of fun is what the Halo um, right. designers called it. Um, so. Those also, are very well yeah. designed. It also does a really good job of creating different identities in the levels. Like I, I can <laughs> think of just in the first like four worlds, like the identity of most of the levels is pretty clearly defined. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I would probably say that I'm not going to pick a like rock band or guitar hero, but the notion of that sort of rhythm based game mm-hmm. um is very well designed. It, it has a, an understandable hook to it. It has a way that it draws in you know a bunch of different players. And you can see, I'm coming to the idea that something is well designed. If it is broadly appealing, this isn't necessarily right. true, but typically when I, if I identify 
a piece of interactive entertainment that is broadly uh, interesting. It's like for the same reason that we might say that, you know, Toy Story is an exceptional movie because that is, you know, objectively people of all different ages can watch that and appreciate right. the, the story, the acting, everything about it, um, you know, pointing to E.T., you know, classics like that as well. Right. Um, so you can also think Godfather is a great movie, not broadly appealing at all. Sure. You don't want to just take like, your kids to that. Sure. Just like um, mm, trying to think of a game that uh, is a little bit more on the. Uh, Dark Souls is a very right. well designed game, but it is certainly not broadly appealing. Right. Um, Silent Hill is a very well designed game. Mm-hmm. Eh, Silent Hill might be pushing it. Yeah. Um, but something, uh, Resident Evil 2. Maybe the remake of Resident Evil 2. I, you know, th- there's some right. that, that you could point to as being being well designed, but not broadly appealing because you move into that horror genre potentially and it's too violent. Grand Theft Auto 5. Grand Theft Auto five yeah probably five mm. if i was to pick one out of the series but i but i i like to focus more on those um right the simpler but the more the more simple yeah. ideas um you know there, there's a reason why tetris has endured for as long as it has and you can find it on everything mm-hmm. in some way shape form or fashion do you have thoughts on, on games that have well, really uh, so so speaking to your simple mechanics, I think we've actually seen that creep back into, you know, so-called like AAA games and things like that, because we've seen, for example, the hero shooters like Overwatch and Call of Duty has adopted some of those mechanics, not all mm-hmm. of them, but some of them. And the idea is that you create these archetypes that have a limited tool set, but that tool set has, you know, different things that interact well together. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but also can interact well with people with different tool sets. And and so it reduces actually the cognitive load because you have more limited options, but that kind of in a weird way can bolster some of the creativity that you can create with those more limited options. Uh, what oh, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what I do want to give it a shout out to specifically is Portal 2. And sure. if, you, if yeah. you have not played Portal 2 with the, well, first, if you have not played Portal 2, play it. But se- and you don't have to play the first one, but but second, play it with the developer commentary on. Oh, that um, is fascinating. For instance, when when uh, there's a point in the game in the middle part of the game where you're using portals primarily as a means of moving paint around, not mm-hmm. actually walking through, but using it to move paint around. And what they found was when they were play testing it. Once people got to the third part of the game where you had to do both, you had to move through portals and move paint through portals. People forgot that they could move through portals. At least it wasn't intuitive. They, it wasn't an idea that immediately came to them. And they had to kind of be like, oh, that's right. I can walk through it. And so what they did was right before a puzzle where you had to do this, they had this like girder fall and block a hallway. And so you have to use the portal to get around the girder. It's the only way to do it. And so it kind of forces you to put into mm-hmm. your recent short-term memory, hey, I can go through portals again, which helps you with the next puzzle. So there's a lot of little things like that that they throw in. And the developer commentary for the game is absolutely fascinating. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the idea of having the limited tool set because I I've certainly found that in general, when games focus on... A, a smaller amount of actions mm-hmm. uh, where the player has agency, but the, the number of player actions are, are limited in scope. It really gives the ability for the player to be innovative within that scope. One of the reasons the original super Mario brothers was so popular. I mean, there was only, there was a very few modalities in that game mm-hmm. that you were operating in. You were small Mario, super Mario, firefly Mario, or, you know, star Mario. That was it. And so you were really working with just how do you move? How do you jump? How do you control the character in these interesting spaces? And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And mm-hmm. so, you know, when they introduced a few more controls in Super Mario Brothers 3 or a few more, more power ups, yeah. the, the core gameplay remained the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, this is one of the reasons why I look at the modern video game controller, which I've got multiple sitting beside me. They all look the same now. Yeah. 
If yeah. you look at the Switch controller, the Xbox controller, and I've got a third-party controller, and I've got a PS4 controller, yes, we move a we yeah. move one stick around. Yeah, no, 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 but, uh, no Nintendo 64 controllers lying around anymore. N- well, not that, on my that desk. That design pattern was abandoned because they, people realized that you don't have three hands. I, it's it's shocking, you know. Um, but you know, as we increase the number of controls on a controller, which had to happen due to Basically, Increasing advent complexity, of, yeah. Yeah, well, the advent of 3D gaming, yep. I think, is the number one thing that happened in the PlayStation 1 era, um, and toward the back tail end of the PlayStation 1 era, and of course, Mario 64, really, that's what pushed us forward, was Mario 64 and having an analog stick to be able to control something in 3D space. But if you look at, you know, the, the standard gamepad controllers from the 80s and 90s, your NES, your Genesis, your SNES controllers, we keep adding more and more and more buttons... And that was definitely a friction point for new people entering gaming into the modern controllers. So now we have a stand, I'm air quoting Mm -hmm. huge here, a standardized controller, which has allowed people's mental model of game control to catch up. Mm -hmm. We're not adding a whole bunch of stuff. And yet, and yet, what is the biggest, most, the fastest growing gaming market? Mobile. 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 Oh, it, touch it, screen. I, I think I mean, a long shot. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's, I mean, it's it's huge. Close. It's way bigger now. Um, this is just a quick little add on to that. I still don't know the controls for Red Dead Redemption Two. I've played like three and a half hours of the game, and I I got tired of. I had to keep looking up the controls. I I honestly couldn't remember them. One is they did they did a lot of changes to the controls that are different, even from. Grand Theft Auto 5, which is the same company, but there's like several button combination things, which at that point you're getting into, you know, literally squaring the possible number of of operations. So, yeah, I oh. because of that, even though the game gets rave reviews and I'm very big into story games and it seems that direction, I just struggle to play it. And I've been playing video games my whole life and I'm 33 like I should, I should be able to figure that out, but I, I struggle with it. Okay, my, my adult life with video games goes like this. Step one: get really excited about new release. Yep. Step two: buy new game. Yep. Step three: excitedly play new game for roughly one to two hours. Yep. Step four: post on Twitter about how cool game is. Step five: life mm. smacks me in face. Yeah. And do not play game for two weeks. Yeah. Step six try to boot the game again and have forgotten all of the systems, all of the controls, all of the story. Step seven, turn off game and open Hearthstone because I still understand how to play wizard poker. Yeah, I I have. uh, I mean, that's the thing, like the idea of a backlog back in the cartridge era. I could never imagine such a thing, but, you know, treasure to every cartridge. But like, hey, Alan Wake was five dollars on Steam, so I bought it because I always want to play it. Which, by the way, after playing Control, I start playing Alan Wake. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely, love don't it. give me don't give me more games to play. I I finally finished uh, Atelier Riza, and that was fantastic. Yeah. About anyway, so I want to talk about other forms of gaming mm-hmm. or just gaming and social norms because you know let, let you know. In, we're we're coming back into the world as best we can as I stare mm-hmm. down, you know, the upcoming semester. And this is a this is a question from um, the role playing stack exchange. But this broadly applies. I'm going to broaden the question, which is. When I'm at the table playing a game, a board game, role playing game. How do I stop myself from interrupting people and correcting them? What? Wait, on- what sorry, what? <laughs> and correcting them on the rules for the game while we are playing. I, you know, social norms have changed. Mm-hmm. I have realized that my social, my adult social skills have atrophied horribly during this time. If my, if my, uh, comments during the most recent several CS faculty meetings are any evidence of my ability to not <laughs> interact professionally with humans anymore, what would I be like at a table if someone said, well, you know, that that spell requires four spell slots and you're not casting it. Like, I think I'm I. Are you are 
So, are you a board gamer? Are you a tabletop gamer? Have I, you had this uh, problem? I'm not a tabletop gamer. I've never actually... I, I have I have honestly tried. I can't get into Dungeons & Dragons. I've never been able to. And... and Is it the dungeon or the dragon? I mean, I, I love fantasy. I love strategic games. I love n- doing math. I honestly do. <laughs> I, I check all the boxes. I, lo- I love dice. I, I have polyhedrons. I have no social skills. I like building <laughs> a story. Like I, I check all the boxes for this guy would love D and D. I have n- I have tried so hard, and I just can't get into it. I think part of it is I like more theme park oriented entertainment, where the 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 structure is set up, and I explore that rather than the creative. Um. So I think that might be it. Anyway. So this is where I I tend to try to make sure that when I'm playing games with people that I I am generally playing games with people that have a a similar mindset to me that is when it's when it's feasible to do so so like I'm in a social gaming community that that's online uh where we play a game called Heroes of the Storm which still technically exists um I mean, it's not getting updated, but it's there. Okay, you can turn on the game and you can go into it. It still right. technically exists. I thought you were Pokemon Unite now, but... No, no, I I, I mean, I actually, I've played that a bit with, but, but for socially, I haven't played that with, with other people. But I've played mm-hmm. lots with other people, and I tend to be on a team that has a similar mindset. We, we do want to win, we do want to practice, we do review our replays, things like that, because that's our shared interest. When mm-hmm. it comes to board games, I'm the person that would rather follow the rules correctly, even if it means I lose, because I like the idea of how a system is designed, and I like thinking through that problem, rather than try to find the path to win, even if it involves bending or breaking rules. That's my mindset, and so I mm-hmm. tend to try to play games with people of that mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm admittedly not the best social gamer that is to say that i play the game for the <laughs> game with people but i'm sure. not like using the game as an excuse to facilitate con- conversation i'm using the game as a way to facilitate social interaction but about the game and i think that's just because generally i have no social skills whatsoever well i okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just gonna start with zero. I was arguing that mine an atrophied. I mean, I I think about some of the. So I used to play Dungeons and Dragons with some of our friends mm-hmm. that we teach with, and, and some of that are, you know have moved to other schools and things like that. But I'm not calling out any names in particular. But for instance, I tried to introduce a, a computer science aspect to one. We did the dining philosopher uh, dining philosophers problem, which is a classic yeah kind of computer sciencey problem I, I don't need to go into it but suffice it to say there's people around a table there's forks and spoons they're trying or forks they're trying to eat spaghetti or whatever and it, it, it's it's a question about locking and one of our colleagues i mean obviously they picked up what it was i mean come on it's you know it's a computer science thing and one of our colleagues said i steal all the forks and just stared at me i was like okay the forks <laughs> reappear and he says i steal all those i'm like son of a st- just solve my computer science puzzle and he's like i steal all my forks i have an infinite fork machine i'm like you're not my friend anymore and then <laughs> uh, so my problem is not necessarily the correction of the rules it's stop just play the game i just do the puzzle i gave you please i spent a no. long time trying to think of something neat so I mean, when it comes to board games with my family, I'm 99%. I'm the banker. And mm-hmm. so I, I go to, I, I'm the person that gets looked at for rule ties or rule, you know, yeah. calls anyway. But, um, you know, you gotta be, gotta be careful as you're, you're getting back in the world and get back to the table. I mean, I, I would just say though, like different and, and, and we talked a little bit about this with, with my preference in gaming where I like theme park as opposed to sandbox. That is, I like, a, a game that someone has structured and laid out the rules for and laid out the world for me to explore, as opposed to something like Minecraft, where I have generally a very simple set of rules and I can, I can build, you know, increasing complexity with that, but it's up to me to create those systems. And, and you know, with I think that's maybe where I struggle with Dungeons and Dragons, because a lot of people are primarily not even really playing the story so much as just having fun with each other in a social setting which yeah. i struggle with 
And I realize how horrible that sentence I just said sounds, no, but yeah. but it's more because our goals misalign. And if the goals misalign of what people want to get out of the game, then, you know, the, those people are going to not have as much fun. I feel like I need to end with something funny. So here's here's a quick funny one as we as we go to the All end. Right. This one came from Stack Exchange Arcade. It has to do with Skyrim. And the question is, my head keeps falling off. What can I do? Well, I think you just, you know, staple that sucker on there and keep on going. Keep on, keep <laughs> on trucking. Healing potions, obviously. I guess, I guess you, a healing you, potion. You drink the healing potions, I guess, by, by pouring them down your stump neck. Oh, <laughs> God. That's that how that works. Um, is that is that no, the that's the episode title? Stump neck? No. <laughs> I need a I need a better episode title. I, there, there are so many videos of beheaded people fighting in Skyrim, and I think it's just because like the health scaling kind of breaks sometimes, and so you're supposed to take fatal damage from it, but you don't always. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's what it is. I'm not entirely certain, but I yeah, I, I've seen more than is. a few videos. I've seen more than a few I, with heads. I have, I have also been it, beaten by a mace from a knight that had no arms. So that happened in Skyrim. Beaten by a mace? I assumed by a, he was psychic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, telekinesis exists in that universe. It it it, it does. Thank and, you all. And that's how you no, end up with all the goat, goats in the sky. Okay all those goats. Thank you all so much for joining us yet again for another episode of Regrade Request. If you have not had the opportunity to subscribe on the podcast service of your choice, we would love it if you'd go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Anchor FM or the whatever tool that you use and go ahead and subscribe and leave us a rating. It'd mean a lot to us. We get a lot of student evaluations that aren't that great. You know what? Just a random five-star review. Could just make our just make our day and that'd just be nice. If you have a question for us or an article or anything that you'd like to talk to like for us to talk about, maybe doomsday scenarios, as Will has suggested. Looking forward to that. Um, just get your bunker ready, get your tinfoil hat ready. It'll be great. Person. It's such a positive person. Yeah, I know. You can send it to us at hosts at regraderequest.com. So for myself and for Professor Will McBurney, thank you again for joining us. Stay safe and watch for falling goats. Ah, we, they're we all part of falling goats. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> well, I synced up on my end. Um, yeah, There's, I mean, uh, if I if I saw a falling goat anywhere, I would expect it to be Skyrim. All it, kinds of it, things fall from the sky, except for the game called goat simulator that we talked about falling goats. Yeah, but there's like, there's only the one goat. You're, 